This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Well, let's pray, and we will dive in here. Can you hear me okay, Donna? Can you hear me okay? <laughs> At least you're honest. Oh, uh. All right. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And this morning, as we uh, talk about what we read this week, we ask that you'd open our hearts and minds to truth. Um, may we encourage one another um, as we center our thoughts around your word. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so this week we covered Second Chronicles, about chapter 5 to chapter 29, getting really close to the end of Chronicles. Anything you pick up, anything you notice? You had a question, babe, and I didn't look into it. Near the end? Oh, okay. I am not sure. So Second Chronicles 19. The son of Ishmael. No, this would not be the same as Ishmael, the son of Abraham. Nope. So, yeah. Right. So, so how this is a bit interpretive. So you're we're leaning into you know what Bible scholars have said, but how it works for me is I right click on it. And um, it's under Ishmael here, and they've tagged it as this person. And so then I can go to different Bible dictionaries, which if I ignore that, and I just, let's say, open a Bible dictionary, or let me do a topic guide. I think my computer's running slow. Maybe we'll do a biblical... Oh, no, that's different. These are the different Ishmaels in Scripture. You have um, son of Abraham, son of Nethanatliah, son of Jehoiah, and uh, of the family of Pasher. So there's several different Ishmaels in the Bible. So... Um, That's okay. So, any other comments or questions? Can we take a nap? Well, I wasn't anticipating that, although um, for most of us, I don't think we'd complain. <laughs> well, um, so Second Chronicles this week, you're co you covered a lot of the story. Let's see, we started with chapter 5 of Second Chronicles. This isn't really the story of King David in this section. Whose story is getting told here? Okay, well, yes, and 
Yeah, so the, the various kings of Israel, yes, um, their story is getting told. Something caught me on with Solomon in chapter 8. I think it was chapter 8. Uh, maybe it was nine. Oh, a couple. Th okay, chapter nine, verse twenty-nine. So, Second Chronicles nine, verse twenty-nine says, "Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet?" And in the prophecy of Ahijah, the Silonite, and the visions of Edo, the seer, against Jeroboam, Boam, the son of Nebat. There's some books mentioned here that we don't have. Okay? They're, it's not a bad thing, or but it's just, you know, they were... How do, how do I say this? There's a lot of history to our nation that's recorded in the Library of Congress and things like that, that um, if the Library of Congress burnt down, there's probably not a lot of other places that have some of those books or whatever. Um, we don't have some of these books. That's okay. We have what God has preserved us. Uh, another book that comes to my mind is the book of Jasher, which gets referred to. So there were these other records of the kings they had. doesn't mean they were, I mean, not everything they wrote was Bible, okay? But they were recording what happened in their kingdom, and not everything there. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, he, no, it's not mentioned. Um, so, so what I'm referring to, okay, the books mentioned here are chronicle-type books. What's a chronicle? Okay. okay, it's a history, and I think it bears with it more the idea of like a um, like an official history. You, you know, uh, Andrew, what book are you reading right now? Your C.S. Lewis book. Chronicles. Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, it's like a historical, actually it's a fictional book, but Chronicle is like that official history of a place type thing. Um, so there's Chronicles of Israel and Judah that got recorded somewhere that we don't have. But what we have is what God left for us to have. You brought up the book of Enoch. It's not a chronicle. It's a su It is not mentioned. It's a pseudo-epigraphical book. And there's your $20 word for the day. Um, so let me break it down. Pseudo I'm sorry? Right. So, what's a pseudonym? Well, I don't know of that definition. Yeah, I think you're thinking a synonym. A pseudonym is like Mark Twain. Was that his real name? No. no it was. It was a name he wrote under. Pseudonym. Right. Did I not? Did I not say it well? Like yeah, similar meanings. Mean yeah. Word. Yeah. Is a yeah. The book of Enoch is pseudo, um, pseudo epigraphical. It's a book probably not written by Enoch, but somebody wrote under Enoch's name in the Second Temple era. So it was actually kind of somewhere around 400 to 500 years before Christ, somewhere in there. It gets quoted a couple times, but it's not directly called out like the, these books are. So, and no, it's not Bible, and it's not in our Bible, and there's probably good reasons for that. So, it does impact our Bible at certain points, but um, that is a discussion for another day and time. Yes, it's mentioned twice. So, all right. So we're covering um, these chapters of Chronicles. Anything else you pick up or notice?
there's through these chapters, um, comparing this to um, kings, there's additional stories, both stories of some of the good kings of Israel that we really didn't have before. Um, and as you watch, Second Chronicles will highlight some of the blessings and successes of those kings. But also it's going to highlight some things about the bad kings and stories that were not in First and Second Kings. Um, and what do you think it highlights when it refers to unfaithful kings? On a whole, the unfaithful kings, there's a, a failure, and it leads the kingdom into hardship. And so in some ways, what's happening here is to the different kings, you could break up these kings and almost do little character studies. Did they follow God? And if they did follow God, how did things go? If they didn't follow God, how did things go? And also with that, you have a bit of a trajectory happening. Okay, so here you have... Um, Wow, well, it's not... Okay, I guess I can't draw. Um, you have one king who he does good. You have another king, he does bad. And another king who does bad. And then you have a good king, okay? But what happens overall to the people or the nation? During the times of good kings, they do fairly well. But as a whole, is the nation going on an upward trend or a downward trend? A downward trend. So the, how do I say this? The choices and decisions of each king, you know, they stand for themselves, but they also set up, as it were, the next generation. Um, and so, anyway. I, anything else anybody pick up? Or are we just all tired today? <laughs> Which is absolutely fine. All right. Well, if that's where we are, why don't we go back to a lesson we started a long, long time ago in a faraway land. Oh, um, back when we were covering the life of Moses, let me pick up a lesson from there. And um, I don't, does anybody still have it with them? I mean, it's been, it's been months. Um, I'll just open it on the screen and you can follow along if you like. Um, Oh, great. It's not there. Google decided to change some of their services this week. So half of my stuff isn't where it's supposed to be. Let me... And of course, I didn't open it ahead of time. All right. We were right at the end of Numbers, uh, where we left off. Num um, we were at Numbers 36. Um, we had been covering how Moses and had, again, been approached by Zelophehad's daughters. There were some complications or problems with land inheritance. Uh, they were given the restriction that they had to marry within their clan. Okay, so uh, it wasn't that it wasn't normally out of line to marry within Israel, but marry someone from another clan. That wasn't a problem. But why with Zelophehad's daughters, why was it important that they married within their clan? Does anybody remember? Exactly. It didn't um, by doing it that way, there, there was not going to be the possibility that other tribes would be able to use marriage to land grab property. All right, um, and so which is interesting because is it fair to the Zelophehad girls that this is their limitations? Well, no, but circumstances have done this, and their decisions that they make of who they marry. Um, if their father hadn't died, if they had brothers, this wouldn't be a restriction they faced. Um, but we will sometimes face decisions in life that are circumstantial. It's not right or wrong. It's circumstantial. And we have to um, live accordingly. So I'm on page six of the handout, which is from a long time ago. 
the front. It says the life of Moses. It has point three X's prepared to enter the land, numbers 26 to 36. And at point J, we've skipped several points, inheritance of Zelophad's daughters, numbers 36. Yeah, wow. All right. I'll zoom in for those who don't have it. All right. So we've kind of been through the story at this point, and at this point in the lesson, we're looking back. So I've got it on the screen. But 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul refers back to this time in the wilderness. He refers back to this, um, the wilderness wanderings. And in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Okay, what's this under the cloud and passing through the sea? Okay, you got the Red Sea and the cloud. Remember the pillar that led them? Um, okay, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat the same spiritual meat and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were for our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. I've highlighted this phrase, these things were for our examples. There is a temptation, and sometimes... I'm going to pick on some people who really like Greek here. There is a temptation to ignore the Old Testament. Because if you only do one language, most people do Greek, okay, uh, in biblical studies. But there is a temptation to like ignore the Old Testament a bit because now we have the New Testament. We have Jesus and we have Paul writing about Jesus, and we, we don't really need as much of that Old Testament stuff. Okay. Now, if you just look at your Bible... How much of your Bible is Old Testament and how much of it's New Testament? A whole bunch is old. I'm going to try to get here. So, a few pages. Oh. Oh. Page six. Yeah, do you need one? Oh, I have a couple. Um, Andrew, come here. Here. Why don't you give those to anybody who wants one? So here's my Old Testament, just for a visual. There you go, buddy. So there's your Old Testament. That's how thick it is in my Bible. And there's your New Testament. I think you could safely say more than two-thirds of your Bible, maybe 75%, I'm sure somebody will correct me, is Old Testament. Now, it is complicated. It is hard. It's older. Morning, Dory. Good, good to see you. Uh, but with that being said, Paul in the New Testament refers back here, and he says, now these things were written for our examples. Now, um, when I was teaching this series, we were heavily focused on Moses and the Israelites and coming out of Egypt. Um, since then, we've got distracted in a good way. Um, we've been going through the Bible story. We've been reading through Scripture together. And as we're doing that, are there many lessons and stories from the Old Testament that we could really take to heart? We see on display, not that it's not on display in the New Testament, we see what it's like to follow God or not follow God. In fact, this last week in our reading, the various kings who were obedient to God, what's it like for them? These are examples for us. And um, so Paul goes on here in verse 6, and these examples serve a purpose. It says, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Okay? What was it that the children of Israel lusted after? 
I think this is important to stop and think about. Okay, the leeks, the garlics, the cucumbers, the stuff from Egypt, they lusted for that. What else did they desire? I'm sorry? Um, y yes, but we haven't quite got there. Most of, their, most of their complaint, most of it was about two things, food or water. Now, specifically the one my wife brought up, it's they wanted the food they remembered from Egypt, certain foods. Um, but if we're going to be honest, if you were in the Israelite shoes and you were hungry and you were thirsty, would you be tempted to complain? I mean, none of us have gone, to my knowledge, I mean, maybe you have days without water or days and days without food and been in the desert that whole time. You know, this is what they're going through. What were they failing to look, who were they failing to look to? They were failing to look. Yeah, and time after time, they would complain to God instead of, Asking God. You see the difference? Like, instead of approaching God and saying, God, here's our need. We, no, no, let's just complain to Moses, or let's blame Moses, or let's threaten to kill Moses. And let's get a, a, a group, a mutiny started to go to Egypt type thing, you know. Um, so the things they generally were lusting after were not always bad things. Uh, verse 7 says, neither be idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and rose up to play. What, what Old Testament scenario is that talking about, where they sat down to eat and rose up to play and practiced idolatry? Golden calf incident. All right, And so this is hearkening back to right there on Mount Sinai when they were given the law, when God had made his covenant with them and they broke it almost right away. Uh, verse 8 goes on, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day uh, three and twenty thousand. Uh, the different rebellions with Korah and the others. And, and Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Okay, so when they complained uh, again about the conditions, and at that one point where God sends serpents to bite them, um, these are lessons for us. Neither murmur ye as some of them, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Uh, now, I know I looked this up like three to four months ago when I had this ready. I don't remember what exactly that's referring to, uh, the destroyed of the destroyer. Um, I'd have to relook that one up. Um, but this, Paul then goes back to his emphasis. Now, all these happened for examples. So now when you and I have situations in life that we don't like, they're uncomfortable, they're challenging, um, we have this precedent, we have this example from the Old Testament saints of don't displease God by complaining or blaming him. Instead, I, I think one of the lessons we should take away is how did Moses usually respond? I say usually because he wasn't perfect, but what, when the people came to Moses, and they, they complained to him, what did Moses do? Did he form? He took it to God. Then, over time, he didn't always quite take it to God. He, he kind of lost it a few times with the people and started blaming them and chiding them. But, on a whole, at least he started pretty well, he took it to God. And that's where we should take our requests as well, our needs, our problems, our trials. Um, they were written for our admonition upon which the ends of the world were come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, taketh heed, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say.
So here Paul in Corinthians is exhorting the believers to think about that Old Testament example. They were tempted time and time again by circumstances, by need, and they didn't respond well. What does Paul say here in verse 13 about temptation? I guess we should talk about 12 first. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. What's this talking about? Okay. Yeah, you, you think you, and also think about it from this angle. Your life's going pretty good, and you think you're walking with God really well, but how are you going to walk with him when things aren't looking so well? When a bump in the road comes, you know, whatever that bump may be. And, um, Right, and then, you, and then you end up in the ER. Um, yes, so there is a prideful element to where, you know, we can, we think we got this down. You know, I've been a Christian for X amount of years. I kind of know what I'm doing. This isn't, but the children of Israel were walking with God. These are the people, this is the generation who saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the fire and the glory and the lightning on Mount Sinai. They saw those things, and yet they still rebelled. But they didn't rebel until there was temptation to do so, which is interesting. Verse 13, this is a great verse, one that it's worth tucking in and memorizing, uh, one that's worth pondering. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Aren't we tempted to always think what we're going through is so unique that nobody else understands. <laughs> okay? There's nothing new under the sun. Now, are there uniquenesses to different situations? Yes, and I don't want to discredit that. But the same temptation, the same troubles, the same trials that we go through are trials other people have gone through as well. Now, it's not that people back in ancient Bible times had problems with their computer. Okay, but do you think they had problems with other things? Probably their chariot or, or their horse. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, or yeah. Um, so those, we suffer or we have the same basic needs through life. Yes, uh, through technology and other things, our lives change and evolve in, in that way and form, and they're different than they were back then. But we go through the same troubles and trials. People got sick, people died, uh, people had disagreements, people um, had family problems and marriage problems and kid problems and parent problems and work problems. These are all things that are common. Um, but we're reminded here, Paul says, but God is faithful. And I, I take this as a promise. It's a truth Paul is declaring, but I want you to think of it as a promise. So God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. What does that mean? Yeah. There are some temptations that are too much for you or for me. And what's too much for me may not be too much for you. But God with his hand holds back too much from our plate. We're held protected in his hand, but God does allow temptations through. He allows what we can bear through for us to grow through. Because yeah. notice what it says next. So God says, he's not going to suffer you to be tempted above your able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. So whatever God's put on your plate, he's also, he, he's kept some things away from you that are too much. There's just too much for you to bear. But the things that he does allow to come on your path, he makes a way of escape. So there's always a way out. 
the excuse, the devil made me do it, or I couldn't help it, or whatever, is not a valid excuse according to this verse. My, yeah, my, my brother or sister made me do it. Uh, yes, I've heard, a, years ago I heard a great illustration of this, and um, I think it's very helpful. Uh, we live fairly close to the mountains, and I think all of you have been or seen through, through a mountain pass, and you've seen those exit ramps for truckers. Now it says, long before you see those exit ramps, there's usually signs warning truckers, you know, steep grade, this, that, the other. And truckers want to avoid those ramps for multiple reasons. One, it's, you know, it slows you down. You don't. <laughs> Two, it's actually very expensive. You get fined pretty bad for using one of those ramps. But if a truck is starting to lose its brake and its ability to hold back the weight of its cargo, it sees one of those ramps. What's going to happen if it chooses not to take it? It's only going to get worse. And instead of going off in a ramp where there's a way of escape, they've gone on down the hill and now crashed in a ravine or something else because they've lost control. And sometimes God gives us the way of escape, but he often gives it to us early whether it's that little check in our spirit, like, oh, you really shouldn't do this. You really shouldn't go there. You really shouldn't, you know, be at this spot or this time or with these people. And you're like, well, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then next thing you know, you're doing things you didn't think you should or would or could do. Um, and so God always gives us a way of escape. Um, and lastly, he says that ye may be able to bear it. So this is, to me, just a wonderful thing to remember, because in the context of we're wrapping up the book of Numbers, we're wrapping up the story of Israel coming out of Egypt and coming into the wilderness and getting ready to go in the promised land. They were tempted with problems. What was their way of escape? When there was no food, what was the way of escape? Who should they cry to? God. When, when there's no water, what's the way of escape? Turn to the Lord. You know? Um, and yet we find time and time again they turn to other means, whether it was like Miriam and Aaron thinking, okay, Moses, you're a little bit too high and mighty here. We need to, you know, level the playing field a little. And no, nope, no, that's not how we're going to deal with things. So there is a way of a stepping ape. Paul then goes on in verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak, unto, I speak as to wise men, judge what I say. This flee from idolatry is worth, I think, talking about. Because in the Old Testament context, you have I, idol problems very quickly. Right at there, Mount Sinai, you have the golden calf incident where they create an idol. But if we're honest, they were creating idols of lots of things. They prioritized the food of Egypt over the God who brought them out of Egypt. They prioritized um, their own comfort, as it were. And, and I say that not lightly, knowing that these people were hungry in a way I have not been hungry. They were thirsty in a way that I have not suffered through. Um, but they put their own personal needs and agendas first, and that created problems. Chapter 34, um, I'm sorry, I'm skipping now all the way to Deuteronomy. So we skipped from the end of Numbers all the way to the end of Deuteronomy here in this lesson. Because um, the lesson series is the life of Moses. So I think we should probably at least cover the life of Moses. Um, I'm not going to do the book of Deuteronomy um, not that it's a bad book to do, but it recaps a lot of things we already covered, and so we'll save that for some other time. But Moses will then eventually die on Mount Pisgah. So Mount Pisgah, here we have a little bit of a map. It's outside the Promised Land. They're going to cross the Jordan River up here by Jericho. Um, but he dies there on Mount Pisgah, verse 6 of Deuteronomy 34. In fact, <clears throat> yeah, we're running out of time, so I'll just... I'll highlight this instead of reading the passage here. No one knows where Moses' body is. Okay? 
Just nobody knows. God took care of it. God buried him. He dies at 120 years old. And according to the Bible, his life is divided up into three 40-year chunks. Uh, I'm, so you have the first 40 years. And what happened in his first 40 years of life? He was an Egyptian. Okay. What happened at about 40 that really set his life for the next 40 years? He kills an Egyptian, he flees, and the next 40 years are in Midian, the wilderness of Midian. Um, there he gets married, there he, he, you know, he, he sees God at the end of that, um, or meets him at the burning bush. So you have 40 years where, I kind of like to look at it this way. The first 40 years as he grew, he thought he could, I think Moses thought he could be the one, and he was the one to pull people out of Egypt. I think that's part of why he killed the Egyptian. The next 40 years, he becomes very dependent. And by the time he's 80, he's a man who's coming back thinking, I can't do this. And God really has to push and prod him into doing that. And then his last 40 years, what does he spend doing there? Yeah, leading God's people both out of Egypt into the wilderness. Um, he had his ups and downs, but he dies at 120 years old. Deuteronomy 34 highlights that there's no prophet like him. And there arose, verse 10, not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, also in Deuteronomy, I don't have it in the handout, there's, there's a promise or looking hope to another prophet who will come. And it says, listen to him, obey him. Now, who is that prophet to come? Any ideas? It's Jesus. Which is part of why, when we get to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew will highlight one of the aspects of Jesus as being like a new Moses. He gives teaching like Moses. He, um, he, the book of Matthew is structured with five chunks, like the five books of Moses. Um, but he will be better than Moses. And so Moses has definitely been a good character study as we've taken quite a long time to do it. He's definitely a man God used, and we watched Israel grow and develop. We watched Moses grow and develop. Um, but any comments or questions as we close out, not just um, this lesson, but the whole series on Moses? I better make sure I didn't miss anything if I need to put another lesson together, but I think that covers... The life of Moses. Yeah, we have, I'll say this, there's a, I have a two volume set on Moses um, in my office. It's a pretty classic set. And early on as we were doing the study, I started reading it. And I had to just put the whole two volume set away. And I'm like, this is horrible. <laughs> and it's like a classic a lot of people enjoy. But the reason I couldn't, I just couldn't handle it is it, it romanticized Moses. Now, should we honor those who live life well and who obey God and are faithful to him. Yes, yes, we should. And we shouldn't try to tear everybody down. But the author would say things like, as Moses was going up on the mount to spend his daily time with God, and, and you know, here he met, meets God at the burning bush. And I'm like, you didn't get any of that out of the text. <laughs> we don't really know what's going on in Moses' life here. Uh, so I had to do my own work. And we've seen Moses through the ups and downs. We've seen Moses where he takes the problems to God. We've seen Moses where he takes it to God, but he complains at God. And we've seen Moses where he smacks the rock instead of, and then he claims, must we, referring to him and Aaron, must we fetch water out of this rock? So he, he's had these progressions. And time he's done really good and time he's not done so good. But look at our own lives. Have you had days where you do really well and days where you, you haven't done so well? Uh, yeah. Most of us struggle with the whining and complaining of, you know, a few kids or work or whatever. Yeah, or one spouse. Yes. So on that note, we'll close it a word of prayer and we'll have our service in just a little bit. <laughs> 
Lord, we thank you for the life of Moses and how we can learn lessons from it. We thank you that Israel also becomes an example for us. Uh, And Lord, we ask that you would help us when temptation comes our way, as we're tempted to complain, to murmur in despair, as the hymn says, Lord, would we turn our problems to you? Would we rest in you for the solution? Lord, make us a people who desire to do what's right and follow you in everything in life. And Lord, we seek to sit back, not passively, but as we actively labor and work for you, we seek to sit in in a place of, of rest, trusting that you're the one who's going before us. You're the one parting the Red Sea and the Jordan River. You're the one providing the quail and the manna. And in our life, in the situations that we face, you will sort out the problems and details. And you will be a blessing and encouragement to us. May we live faithfully dependent on you this week. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.